Okay, let's get right to it, and we're going to look at uh, Marks and Keynes today. <clears throat> just briefly, everything we do for the rest of the way in economics, which is only two more sessions, is just introducing it for everybody. It's not a separate <clears throat> economics class. This is just enough to uh, perhaps pique your curiosity and, and uh, go do the research. And... Uh, because we have more pressing needs, uh, given uh, the times right now. Uh, but this will give you an idea. Uh, we left off at uh, Smith, Ricardo, Malthus a little bit, but just the, the big picture. And, and many of the lines that Smith already started uh, take us uh, to Marx's criticism. So on the board, you see this picture first. We about that right now. But just this man, an agrarian man on his property in... Most of human history, he's got a family. They grow up doing what he's doing. We do have to remember that Marx was a sociologist in addition to an economist, a, a bad economist, as we'll see. But uh, we have to understand him sociologically. But we're also going to split him apart because we're not going to talk about the cultural dimension until a few weeks. We just, we're just extracting the economic uh, aspect. And so... I have identified uh, three and then four, if you add his labor theory of value, but just three tendencies in his criticism of what happened in the Industrial Revolution and with the advent of capitalism. Uh, the first one is in that division of labor we talked about with Smith, the Adam Smith. With the, the division of labor becomes the displacer of the total man here. Uh, even Smith had said that after the division of labor has once thoroughly taken place, it is but a very small part of um, that which man's own labor can supply him. So uh, whether that's valued necessities or conveniences <coughs> or even amusements, uh, all the things that man could produce on his own, uh, the uh, not just the jack of all trades, master of none, but to a certain extent, master of all trades. He had to do that, but but that but that was his total life, and um, the division of labor uh, does something to that. Obviously, we talked about the good things about that. Smith did, but Marx looks at the same thing, and he says. As labor is specialized, and if you can't see, it's a small part of the drawing. These are just those people at the assembly line again, putting together pieces, and that leads to efficiency and low-cost products, many more of them, and so forth and so on. But, but Marx looks at that same thing and says, well, as labor is specialized, the individual becomes more like one of those cogs in the machine that he works with all day. He's less capable to do the sum of things that a, that a master of all trades could once do. And I think that aspect of Marxist theory might become appealing to a lot of people right now who are not revolutionaries and who are scared of what's coming in a couple of weeks or months or with more social unrest and you feel unprepared. I do. Uh, you know, when we were kids, there was this uh, show, MacGyver, that guy could, that, that could do everything. He could build a bomb with like a toothpick and some toothpaste or something. And, and, uh, and, and perhaps we've had fathers or grandfathers that could do things like that. And most of us can't do that because we've either been living in cities or we got jobs early, but they were service or customer service jobs, or maybe in the information age, we're good at that, but we're not, we can't, uh, build a, a house and a garden and a, you know, and that whole thing. And Marx is lamenting this, okay? This makes individual man more dependent on and more drowned within mass society. And so with Marx, other thinkers parallel to Marx, even guys like Kierkegaard, but later Marxists would, uh, and existential philosophers, <coughs> would lament the, the, the mass society, the, the person drowning in the mass of society, okay? Well, just to take that one aspect of the individual becoming less of, less of a man, I suppose you could say, um, in addition to that argument being exaggerated, it's also pretty ironic. Marxists lamenting the loss of the self-made man. Um, that's interesting. But beyond that, let's ask ourselves the question, is 
diversification of persons in some community task, is that such a modern product? Uh, have we not read 1 Corinthians 12 or Romans 12, 4 through 6, a <coughs> body with all of its parts? Now we can debate whether this is a worthy project or not and, and things like that. But in addition, Marx's criticism also overemphasizes the material dimension of man. See, he's less of a man because of this. Why? He lost this uh, in place of this. Well, that really overemphasizes the material dimension of man, such that if, if his labor becomes more of a commodity in a task that is not his own, therefore he is dehumanized. You see that? So this assumes that his identity was his material product, not just his rugged individualism, which is ironic that the Marxist is complaining that, that's lost, but that his material product was his identity. Now, this is another irony that one will continue to see in the critics of capitalism. By the way, when we were growing up, when you heard the word materialism and materialist, what did you think of? You didn't think of the Marxist <coughs> revolution. You thought of keeping up with the Joneses. You thought of capitalism. That's the way the word's used. Commercialism, mass society, what they're trying to, they're lying to you in the commercials and blah, blah, blah. That's what you think of when you think of materialism. The irony is that the shoe's on the other foot. It is the, it is the critic of capitalism uh, who is really the quintessential materialist, judging things falling short by virtue of how it does not produce a material utopia, a material panacea, okay? Well, in addition to that, you also have industrialization, represented by the factory and miniature there, where you, you lose this in favor of this, and then with that also urbanization, where man is displaced, he has to go to the city center to uh, be a part of that product. So urbanization is the displacer of property. And this will lead us to Marx's first of many uh, criticisms of different social spheres. Most of that will leave for the cultural part of it, but this one I think we can talk about here, property. You see, in, Marx, in Marx's mind, the economic forces here in industrializa industrialization, because if I say, well, he could choose to stay on the farm or he could choose to go to the factory, nobody's forcing him. Well, what Marx would say is that the forces paying for that are so overwhelming. And so the notion of this being a free choice of the laborer to urbanize is conceived as a farce. The laborer is reduced to a commodity. He is a tool in the capitalist's property machine. He has gone from having property to <laughs> being property. Thus, industrialized property is robbery and slavery. You see how that works in their mind. Industrialized property displaces you as having property over here where you where you are property. Okay. Well, let's make an evaluation of that, and, and many could be made. But Marx could not have foreseen how one's assets increase exponentially with their productivity and value to employers. How in capitalism your money works for you while you're sleeping, accumulating interest and so forth. You have a share in the company. Whether we're talking about the freedom to choose products or savings or retirement, and as I said, investing in the company's stocks, and, and how all of this tends to expand the middle class rather than shrink it. And so in Marx's mind, part of the thinking here was that this would lead to a property, only, only two classes left. When he thought he only had three conceptions in his mind the capitalist, the laborer, the proletariat, that would say the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, and this guy that was being displaced, um, he had no concept of the middle class and a growing middle class. Okay? But that's what you actually see in capitalism. And that's one of the main things that even people that didn't understand economics at a deep level understood the failure of Marxism, at least in the sense that, well, he didn't see how this would create this enormous middle class that would outgrow the other classes. Well, that leads to Marx's uh, big economic blunder, because these are really all just a sociology of economics in one sense. 
But in terms of any contribution that he made to economic theory, in his major book, Das Kapital, in, in 1872, he proposed what is, has been known as a labor theory of value. And what Marx did is he built on the two kinds of value that Smith discussed. And so you had value in use and value exchange. This is a picture frame. Because one of the places I used to work at was a, a picture frame place where you put those together. And I was kicking myself last week. I said, I should have just used that as an example on the, for the division of labor and machinery and stuff like that. But I didn't. Well, here it is, value in use. And then what somebody's willing to pay for is its value. So you have this one and this two. Marx is going to add an idea, and then he's going to get a third concept of value out of that. Okay, so he's got the use value and the exchange value. Well, what Marx does is he immediately deviates from the meaning. As he looked at commodities being exchanged for each other, being of equal value, and not because of any of these price signal and some, uh, you know, voluntary exchange forces and what people subjectively value in it, but he started to see an inherent value right here, an equality here that's inherent. And the value is equal precisely because of some idea. So he's got to back that somehow, right? And, and Marx knew full well that most such things that were exchanged we're not the same thing, metaphysically speaking. Obviously, you go back to the bartering system, the cow and all that stuff. Um, so they're not the same thing. But there has to be some common notion, some idea, some object, you might say, that lay behind uh, some idea that represents the exchange. One of the oddest things about this is this is as close as a materialist will ever come to being a realist. He had to come up with some essence that these were simply the species of. But at any rate, so what was that for Marx? Well, for Marx, that common object was labor. The labor that it took to produce this picture frame is that inherent value that sets that at 30. 30 dollars. I just picked a number. Uh, cheap, cheap picture frame, okay? Or 19th century, I don't even know what it was. It wasn't that much. But um, this is a strike one and strike two all at once here in one swing, because as we've seen, Wealth is not the nominal representation of the good, in that 30 in this case, uh, but the creation of the good itself. And Marx would say, exactly, but it's the laborer that built this thing. It's entirely the laborer who built this thing. And, uh, but we've also seen that that's not true, that the creation of that good is a complex of labor. Yes, labor went into it but also the capital it took to produce both metaphysical and physical. The machinery, the picture frame didn't assemble itself, nor did the laborer who just showed up on the job invent the machine that compresses that and injects the staples and the glue and all that stuff. That All of that goes into capital production. So I have descending from his mind, in both his head that is red, that's the metaphysical capital, and dot, 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 that whole circle is the capital. So in Marx's view, the fantasy view, it's represented in that purple color. The reality that we've already seen is represented in this red color. So there's just two warring visions here, okay? But Marx ignores the rational creative engine and reduces the capital side to only one thing. What's capital? Well, it's the capitalist merely paying only enough to seize, I know I mixed this guy over here, he was the poor guy that was getting displaced, over here he's the capitalist, so just work with me there. But Marx is reducing the capital here to the capitalist merely paying enough to seize the laborer's labor, which unit of labor produces value X, in this case 30, that's what I picked. So that the finished product is always worth more than the labor he was willing to pay. And the excess off the top of what he was willing to pay is what we call profit. So I have over here, just to oversimplify it, but it's what Marx was saying, is that the labor is the real value, but then since he was only willing to pay X amount and the product is that amount, 
labor minus the profit equals theft. And so profit is theft. And since he's already been displaced and has no property, the property class, well, that would mean that property is theft. Isn't that interesting? And that goes into his theory as well. And so now he has a term for this, the profit. I said there was three values here. Here's one, here's two, use and exchange. But this third, uh, it's what we're calling the profit. He's going to call that a third kind of value, and that is surplus value, which really ought to be belong, rightly, to the laborer. So, employers are stealing part of their labor because the wage received from it is less than the contribution of their labor to the final value. In other words, to the selling price of the finished good. Well, let's evaluate that really quickly. We've already kind of already done that. But, you know, besides my way of answering this, which is built into our uh, beginning of our economic section, the first two or three sessions really dealt with this because that you had that totality of metaphysical and physical capital from the supply side. Okay, um, that, that really, that in other words, this red line is the real total value here. But if you want a more technical and an early, there, there's more technical later refutations of this. And most people hardly need to, to hear it now because it's totally discredited among uh, economists. But there was an early essay in 1884 written by someone named Philip Wicksteed. And it's called Das Kapital. A criticism and it's an 1884 essay and I commend that to anybody who wants to go further but he basically makes three lines of criticism that three things Marx is missing essentially okay so that's if you want to look that up uh, the spelling of that is uh, Philip Wicksteed W-I-C-K-S-T-E-E-D uh, Das Kapital a criticism okay let's move on to Keynes briefly because we'll get to test out the supply side vision versus the Keynesian vision in the next session. But the, the, there is basically the Keynesians, the interpreted view of Keynes, the received Keynesian view, which is a bit oversimplified. And in their mind, there's a refutation of Say's law. You remember Say's law was supply creates its own demand. Demand is implicit in the supply. Okay, I, it sort of corresponds to that, but that's the circle I had up there. Um, matter of fact, let me do some erasing. In the Keynesian vision, yeah, he's got the shovel. We're going to make him the supply side. Interestingly enough, he also has the dollars. Okay, I'm not going to do that and feed into the caricatures more than that. But anyway, this guy will have the dollar bill this way, and that'll just represent uh, the demand side. Uh, that's as simple as we can make it. Say's law is saying, and so that would be red, Say's law is saying that this is implicit in the supply. That's the circle. Sorry if that's not thick enough. That's what generates this, that 2.0. Remember that? But when a Keynesian hears that, uh, if, you know, and Keynes himself was not guilty of this particular issue, they remember, they believe that wealth is created by uh, the government, or by money, or by your gold reserves. It's, it's some form of the old mercantilist idea. Okay, and so they understand supplies, they misconstrue it as government largesque. And so when they hear Say's Law, they hear things like that. Um, and, and that is oversimplified too, but we'll talk about another way that they misconstrue that. Um, so their premise is this, very basic simple argument in their mind, what they're hearing and how they process it. The premise is that Output and employment respond chiefly to the rate of consumer demand. Um, I am going to give you what you want. Why? Because I want in exchange that money. And so because I want that, I'm willing to give you this thing. And so you're kind of, you know, I'm the pinata at that point, right? And, uh, and so th this is really what generates everything. That's the name of the game here. Like if you want to simplify everything to its basis thing, the Keynesian believes this is what generates everything, and the supply side of believes, no, this is what generates everything. This metaphysical and then physical capital is what generates everything. Okay, that's, you know, let's, let's break everything down to that. 
But because of that, output and employment is responding chiefly to the rate of consumer demand. Therefore, the role of government is to maintain suitable levels of aggregate or total demand. So I'm going to, uh, I haven't drawn government yet, but uh, since it's the foundation of everything, in their view, let's put it down here. So what's the role of government? Whether it is in your, um, well, how am I going to represent that? Whether it's in your monetary policy or whether it's in your, it doesn't matter, your fiscal policy. I, ha I know I haven't introduced those words, but the, the Fed, and that's a whole other story, or your fiscal policy. This is basically the interest rates that you set for your banks that does all the lending. And so that, that's tied to a lot of things in your economy. Your fiscal policy is things like, the main thing you think of is the level of taxation, but of course it also refers to regulation and stuff like that. But your fiscal policy is what you're, you know, the, is basically the, so government is, can introduce static into this, into what we've said is the price system. Why am I representing it like that? I don't know. Uh, that's your static. Now, a Keynesian, though, is going to see this in a positive way, building up, oh yeah, let's right under his dollar. He's building up this, not only to get this going, but often to stabilize those unstable business cycles, okay? And so when, when, they, when they say, well, that's how wealth is created and what wealth is, uh, so the role of government is to maintain those levels of demand and so you see, government supply is a function of where demand is. And so that's their understanding of why Say's law isn't a thing. Um, and, and, it, and it conditions how they hear it, which we'll see. Now, Keynes himself didn't doubt Say's law, but instead focused on the problem of excess savings. Um, the problem of excess So he has to see it as a problem first. Um, if you have various forms of investment continuing, all is well, but not all will. There's, he talked about animal spirits, almost like a Puritan, but he did so with respect to consumer fears and erratic changes in behavior. Maybe there's a natural disaster, but, but usually it's just fear-driven. But there's also producer fears, and that can delay risk, which delays, that's just delaying investment. He also talked about a paradox of thrift, Saving now for a better expenditure later. So what's happening there? Well, the thrift paradox assumes some target income or some target level of saving. And this is the way government planners think in general. They think about how smart they are and how little everybody else has thought about anything. Okay? And so there's a target income everybody has. There's a target level of savings. And so that if you just give people a tax cut, which is another problem, we'll come to that. If you just give people a tax cut, give people more of their money back, and it provides over and above that amount, that targeted spot, well, people will just tend to take that extra money and shift toward leisure and away from productive spending, certainly away from investing. And again, this is a clue to how Keynesians understand trickle-down economics, um, which we'll get to, as I said, just in a second. But these, so this delay in uh, genuine investing and so forth and saving, <clears throat> these equal the same kind of goods glutting the market. What happens is if people stop because they've reached that target, then certain key products um, will just waste on shelves, unused supply, surplus. Workers will be laid off as demand for products nosedives. And that theory crystallized right at the time that the Great Depression was starting, and so it seemed to confirm the idea. The name of the game then for Keynesians, for Keynesian economic theory, which by the way is all post-Depression administrations, starting with Roosevelt, the name of the game for them, it is all, all of them except for Kennedy and Reagan, as we will see, the name of the game is, number one, how to regulate that aggregate demand, represented by this one person's dollar, but we're talking, he's representing all demand. How do we regulate that total or aggregate demand to maintain full employment 
And then secondly, how do we do that without generating inflation? We'll recall that more money chasing the same pie of goods is the very definition of inflation. Keynesians at least understand that much. And so how do we pump this up without going over the levels of supply and, and leading to inflation? Okay. Um, and so what are they? We have a name for that. It's called micromanaging people's lives. Okay. But you're just doing it with a whole economy here. Okay. Now there's a lot of economic fallacies that parallel these and that are, um, that go along with it. But I think what I'll do is I'll wait to the second session to go into those before we introduce the empirical data of the 20th century. Okay. So let's cut it there.